All right, so reading this section, you might have noticed that there's a lot of uh, seemingly theoretical aspects, like the examples give you exa uh, tables of values, they give you the limits, and they give you the graphs. But if you were to think about it and say, well, what's the main skill I want to have from this section? I would tell you that the main skill is finding vertical asymptotes. So this is something that's somewhat of a review, but we're looking at it from a different perspective. And if it's not a review for you, it's certainly something you want to know how to do anyway. I'm going to go through what I think are a few of the special cases that would come up when you're looking at vertical asymptotes. So my, for my first example, I have a very simple function. This is a rational function. You'll see that it, essentially a rational function is a fraction with two uh, polynomials. And when I'm looking for vertical asymptotes, what I'm looking for are what values make the denominator zero, but not the numerator. This example I called a simple example because there isn't much to the denominator, right? And anytime I'm looking for vertical asymptotes, I'm going to be looking at the denominator. In this case, the denominator is x minus 1. And if I'm going to say, well, when does x minus 1 equal 0? Well, if I add 1 to both sides, right, it'd be when x equals 1. I probably didn't even have to write anything down to know that. And I say, well, okay, what about the numerator? Well, the numerator is x. So when x equals 1, x is 1. So in this case, at x equals 1, the denominator is 0, the numerator is non-zero, so that means that we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. Now this one algebraically was pretty easy because of the simplicity of the function, but this is the process I'm going to use every single time. Let's take a look at another one that's a little more complicated. Here, all I did was change the denominator. So the numerator stayed the same, but this changing the denominator makes it a new function. And this time I have x squared minus 9 for my denominator. So now I say the same thing. Okay, where does this equal 0? If I want to know where a vertical asymptote is, that's going to be where I start. So I say, where does this equal 0? Now there's two ways to handle this, right? I could move the 9 over there, or I could factor. Um, if I was to move the 9 over, x squared equals 9. And then I take the square root, right? But... It's not really taking the square root. We have something called the square root property that says this is going to be plus or minus the square root of 9. So people will say we're taking the square root of both sides. That's not exactly true, but I did take the square root of 9 to find this. So I get plus or minus 3, plus or minus the square root of 9. So now i got to say, okay, i got two possible values for vertical asymptotes, x equals 3 and x equals negative 3. What happens when I plug these values into the numerator? I look up here in the numerator is x. When I plug in 3, I get 3. That's non-zero. Okay, when I plug in minus 3, well, it's just x, so I get minus 3. So it's non-zero. So in this case, I have asymptotes at x equals positive 3 and x equals minus 3. It would be okay to just mark this as your answer. Our asymptotes are lines, so they have an equation. And since they're a vertical line, they're an x equals a number. Or you could just say um, that we have at x equals 3, comma, x equals minus 3 that would be okay as well. Either answer is totally all right. Again, notice the process was the same, right? So far though, we've seen a pretty simple uh, numerator, but even when the numerator is more complicated, if I plug in this value, it made the denominator zero, it didn't make the numerator zero, so that means it's an asymptote, it's an equation, and you can have more than one vertical asymptotes. All right, this example is a little bit reverse. Remember, I said I wanted to go through a few different cases. In this one, to me, you know, we could all have our own opinions, but to me, the numerator seems more complicated than the denominator. That doesn't change my process, so I say, okay, I'm supposed to find the vertical asymptotes. Well, the starting point is figure out where the denominator would be zero. Now, I can look at it until it's minus one, but just for the sake of practice, I'm going to write it out and say, okay, I'm supposed to determine where the denominator, which is x plus one, equals 0, so that would be when x equals minus 1 by subtracting 1 from both sides. I say, okay, this is my candidate for a vertical asymptote, and I double check what happens when I plug it in here. Since this is a little more complicated, I'm going to go ahead and actually write it out up here. So when I plug in minus 1 into only the numerator, I'm looking at this in two pieces, I get minus 1 squared minus a negative 1 minus 2. All right, so that's positive 1 plus 1 minus 2, oh, this is 0. All right, remember the rule. The rule says you have a vertical asymptote if it makes the denominator 0 
and does not make the numerator zero. However, x minus one makes the denominator zero and the numerator zero. So this is not an asymptote. Not a vertical asymptote. What's really going on, which would be a fair question, uh, I'll get into a minute. But first, I think it's fair to say too, what would you actually answer here? Um, all you would say is there are no vertical asymptotes. No vertical asymptotes for this function. Not every function has them, and this one happens to not have one. But what is really going on? Like I said, that's a fair question. Um, if you take a look at the numerator, that's a quadratic, right? These factor a lot of the time, not always, but they factor a lot of the time. So let's see if this one factors here. So this is just extra work. We already answered this. We're just kind of looking at what's going on. Um, this looks like it might factor into, let's see, we got x. I'm looking at factors of negative 2. We got to have it add up to uh, negative 1. So I could use a positive 1 and an x minus 2. Double check that. I'd get x times x, x squared, minus 2 times x is negative 2, plus 1 times x is negative 1, and then I get my negative 2, so that looks good and over x plus 1. That's the same function just rewritten. But what happens? Look, these are factors, so they cancel. So this equals x minus 2 as long as x doesn't equal minus 1. Why do I say x can't equal minus 1? Because there is a problem. It's actually a discontinuity, which we talk about in 3, 3. There is a problem at minus 1 because it makes the denominator 0. That's just not, that's not something we want to see. But in the end, this function's equivalent to x minus 2. So if we were to actually graph this, there would just be a hole at minus 1, not an asymptote, but just a hole. So that's why, even though it seems like there could be an asymptote, we actually don't have one. Finally, I have a function that doesn't seem that different. You may say, well, I've, you've shown me a few examples. I think I get it. I'm going to set the denominator equal to 0. And you're right, that's what we're going to do. So you may be asking yourself, well, what's special about this example? Are you just deciding to do a bunch of them? No, this one's a little bit different. But I'm going to start out the usual way. I say, okay, x squared plus 3 equals 0. x squared equals minus 3. Okay, and what do I do here? Well, I remember from last time, x would equal plus or minus the square root of negative 3. Now, depending on how much you remember from algebra, this is an imaginary number, right? So I could factor out an i out of this. But in this case, we're not worried about imaginary numbers. A vertical asymptote has to be a real number from our perspective. So in this case, there are actually no vertical asymptotes. We could not find a real number that makes a denominator zero. So we can't, we don't even have a candidate to start from because remember that's how we get our candidates and then we double check it with the numerator. So I think with these four examples that you've seen essentially all the different types of cases that could come up, problems may look different, but in the end you're going to do the same process and then you're going to decide, you know, is there one asymptote? Are there two? Are there none? And if there's none, why? And if you can do that, then you'll be doing fine for the homework and for the exam.